Hi, it's Gadget UK here again. An exciting box from the States. This is amazing, an absolutely amazing donation. Seriously, I have been looking for one of these for a long while. Now, originally I was looking at the 808 uh, 8 version, you know, the Commodore A2088, is it? Uh, it's a PC bridge board for an Amiga. And it's the 286 flavor, which are even harder to find. So definitely check out Chris Edwards' channel down below. You can see he's been working on some cool things, lots of Amiga 3000 stuff, recently some 2000 stuff, really rare upgrades and stuff. Yeah, if you've not already subscribed to him, you must check his channel out. He's a fantastic guy. And he's pretty funny and charismatic as well. But you can see, just look how amazing this board is. It's quite a large board as well. It's quite thick at this point because you've got this little sub board that fits on top. I really need to get the wrist strap on. It's in excellent condition. Dallas uh, DS1287. He kind of said he had one of those and he said I could send it, but the couriers don't lay certain batteries in the uh, post and uh, buy a, you know, airplane and stuff, airmail. Uh, but I've got one of these, so I've got a brand new one unopened somewhere. And uh, I'm curious to see whether it works or not, uh, the uh, placement I've got. So, isn't that a piece of uh, art? Absolutely gorgeous. It's in excellent condition. So it's even got the floppy cable here. I don't have a drive to connect that to, I don't think. Yeah, so as I was saying, Chris has recently covered one of these on his channel. It's the uh, 386 version. This is the 286. So somewhere on here, I'm not sure where, there's going to be a 286 CPU. This top board straight away here has got the uh, RAM, I think, and obviously uh, BIOS and stuff. Maybe keyboard controller. I'm actually not sure. Well, I say keyboard controller, you so said there's no external keyboard for this. The Amiga does everything. <laughs> this is the thing. This is the bit I've got to get my head around. So, you know, you plug this into the 2000, 3000, or 4000, and, and you've got a bridge between the Zorro side and the 16 bit ISA side. So, uh, yeah, you can have a PC in your Amiga. So, with the wrist strap on, I've just pulled the top board off. It's just pressure fit. So we've got the 287 coprocessor socket here. I may have one of those, if not, I'll, uh, I'll definitely get one. And we've got a uh, 10 megahertz 286 there by AMD. So you can swap this out. From what I understand, one of the crystals, perhaps not on this board, maybe on the other board. I oh, man, there's a few on here. There's one here. I'm not sure what speed that is without looking at magnification. And we've got one over here. But the bottom line is you can change the crystal so I don't know, say 20 megahertz for example and that may work on here I think you can get these up to 25 actually in that package and there's a crystal on here as well and jumpers it's a case of you know, changing the, the crystal here changing the CPU change some jumpers and then in theory you should be able to run it a bit faster RAM is going to be a limitation we've got some RAM here as well look that looks like RAM so it's interesting we've got 1, 2, 3, 4 RAM there and then some RAM on here some of this may be uh, for interfacing between the Zorro side and stuff. Yeah, that's like 44256. So I'm not sure if we've got 2 meg there. That looks like a, a delay line. Obviously, we've got the real time clock. That looks like a floppy controller. Yeah, it's WDC. But then again, there's some what could be floppy related stuff on here. And it could just be chipset stuff. Picked in a standard PC chipset stuff that's got WDC, Western Digital Controller, is that Faraday? So, yeah, these are your main PC sort of side of things. And I think over the side here, we've got a couple of Commodore A6 uh, MOS there, 5718, another Commodore one there, CBM ABT, what looks like a Toshiba part number there, TC176032 AT. So, yeah, that's going to be bespoke to this, I think, the end of the 286 card. The same chip might have been used on the 386, I'm not sure. Another delay line up here, lots of 74 series. These chips here are PALS, I think. There's one up there as well with the factory bodge wire on it. More 74 series, quite a lot of 74 series down here. Quite a lot of 74 series down on the bottom there. So very cool, though, isn't it? It's in excellent condition. There's, there's, you know, there's no damage or anything to this. This is just incredible. What a lovely donation. I can't thank you enough, Chris. This has uh, really made my Christmas of this year. So, yeah, I'm going to reattach this. It's a case of just carefully lining everything up here. 
making sure I don't get the rows and columns uh, mislined even slightly by one pin because yeah it would be a bad day and just massage these back together yeah they don't fit completely flush here there is a natural gap of about that much uh, and it's the same on this side here and uh, on this side there's this little plastic standoff here that just keeps it away from the crystal so there we are sandwiched back together now uh, and there is strap that is on all the while handling this so I think I'll go and get the uh, Janus software because that's the software you need to you know to get this working on the Amiga and uh, it's still on the compact flashcard I'm using here I think I'll pro probably try and do that in an emulation environment I might try and film that I assume I can do that I'm assuming that WinUAE can emulate one of these boards maybe maybe it can because that could be the thing you see I've, I've not got the original discs what I might need to do is well create the original discs maybe on the 1200 go and get some blank floppies create them on the 1200 and then I can have some install discs and we can try and install it on the 2000 here this has got the TF536 in the moment I don't know whether anyone's actually tried one of these bridge boards with the TF536 so yeah we've got different options here I've got different some different CPUs and things we could try if we can't get it working with this and of course this is going to eat some of the Zorro address space probably 2 meg something like that so you know if you want additional Zorro 2 RAM in a 2000 uh, like this you would need to limit it to 6 meg probably yeah. and so and that, that, that 6 meg can be an issue as well because it does the halving thing so if you've got an 8 meg board in here an 8 meg RAM board like the Lift 2 one just by virtue of installing this in it'll half the 8 meg to 4 meg so they end up with 4 meg and a card like this so this is where you might need another Zorro RAM board to give you an additional 2 meg and before I go and try and set up the Janus stuff, let's just try and install this together. Now the first problem here, on a flat bench like this, this is going to be a problem. Yeah, it sticks out. So actually I'm just going to unscrew that. I'm just going to remove those two screws there. Yeah, there we go. You can see I've just removed that plate. It just means that, as I say, it's going to be able to fit on this uh, bench here. I'm also just going to just disconnect this floppy cable, actually. So the green uh, line is towards the top there. And if we just sort of line it up with the slots here. I'm just double checking everything's the right way around here. Obviously, you can't get it around the wrong way really, because the Zorro slot is way bigger than the ISO ones. And then uh, I think he, he did a karate chop when he plugged his in. Oh, there we go, it's going in. Push down on that side. And it's on that side. Yeah, so there we go. Went in, no issues at all. Make sure there's no wires trapped anywhere. And I think we'll just power it up and just see what it reports in the way of Zorro boards. Right, it's beaten from IDE, so it is actually working. It's not killing the system or anything like that. Yeah, on Kickstart 3.1 here, holding both mouse buttons down, we can get into the expansion board diagnostics bit here. And it's showing the uh, board there. Obviously, we've got the 536 uh, showing up there as well, both working. But it fails to boot. I don't know. I think this is actually a problem with the 536. I might just try it in this this further slot, the one that's further away. The other thing I'll do, I think, while I'm thinking ahead, is order two of these smaller slots here so that we can have, you know, three 16-bit ISA slots, because that's what these are here. These are PC ISA slots, the first of which is free is there. And then I can have, like, a sound card, a VGA card, and a, I don't know, a network card or something like that. Assuming it works in this slot at some point. So I cleaned up the uh, CPU slots adapter there for the 536. Look at the uh, black stuff that's come off that. Now bear in mind, it's gold plated. So, yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? Maybe it's uh, some solder from old connections or something. Something that was plugged in there. But, uh, yeah, you wouldn't expect it because these are not solder coded. And that is not solder coded. It's gold plated. But anyway, it's now booted. And that isn't what I expected, actually. I didn't think the uh, CPU slot there would cause that to be the issue, but... Yeah, it's actually booted now. So if we go into sysinfo, maybe it'll work alongside the 536. I just want to see if sysinfo reports the board. Uh, boards, yeah, there we go. A2288 bridge. That's interesting, the size is 512k. Hmm, maybe it doesn't use 2 meg then. That's quite good. That means you could get, well, in theory, 7.5 meg trying to achieve that would be quite difficult but uh, yeah anyway six megs gonna not gonna be a problem is it then you could add an extra one meg if you had a one meg card somewhere 
Yeah, at this point in the video here, I used the emulator WinUAE and tried to emulate the bridge board setup uh, and install the Janus drivers, and it just didn't go according to plan. I fast forwarded through all this, but basically, at the end of it, it kind of just stuck on the install screen with something about blocks or something. You couldn't click on anything, you couldn't do anything, it just didn't seem to work. I looked at the readme here first, contained on the driver disk, it appears to cover a few different types of upgrade. You've got the sidecar for the Amiga 1000, you've got the 2088 XT bridge board for the 2000, and the 2286 which we have here, you know, the bridge board for the 2000. It says the 2000 for each of those, but they do work in the 3000 or 4000. It probably also needs the PC BIOS assigning there in when you've got a 2286 or a 2386 set, or even for the XT card. So it didn't go according to plan using uh, WinUAE. I've used version 2 of the disk, the install disk, on there. It's totally possible that the version that goes with the 386 card has got a later version of the Janus driver, and it might work better with the 386 disk, I don't know. Let's just try with version 2. I've got the compact flash card here back into the 536, so yeah, we didn't do anything with that. Couldn't install the drivers. Right, let's just try and go through the install, it's just it always comes up over there. Now I think it's the bridge install one. This is the thing, you know, we read that readme there in WinUAE, and it says it does a number of things, there's a sidecar thing, uh, something else, and something else, something else. What's the 512? I don't know, I think it's just that one. They could have named those back, couldn't they? Let's face it. Now this is as far as I got in WinUAE, and then it just came out, bombed out straight away. The file block selected to install, zero, and it's frozen. So I don't know, maybe it's not compatible, yeah, I think it's not compatible with 536. So a different approach, we've gone with the 68000 and the AT card, using the same compact flash card they use with the 536. So let's just see if we get any further using the stock 68k CPU. It says clean up RAM disk. There you go, it's bombed out again. This is the problem, I don't know why. The software just bombs out. Oh, right, you saw that go wrong there, and uh, yeah, the TF536 just reset in the middle of it, and it corrupted the compact flush card, it's a good job I had a backup. So I spent uh, 15 minutes rewriting the image back to the compact flush card, whilst it was in the PC I thought, let's use WinUAE and install Janus 2.1, it was thanks to Jan Beta that I got the idea of using that Janus 2.1, and installed it, we've got a PC folder here, so if we go into PC prefs, that never ran in WinUAE. So you can see the default settings here. The Janus uh, handler load segment is that address there, D000. Both mono and color enabled, so I'm not gonna change those, we'll just leave those at the default. And uh, if we go into PC color, hmm, I'm not sure that's working because we've just got a single flashing cursor, or the cursor could be the PC has booted. Let's do a PC reset and go there. That made no difference whatsoever. Um, let's try PC Mono. Hey! That is working. Strange how it doesn't work on PC Color. So we've got a battery failure there. Oh, there's the flashing cursor. So I don't know what the issue is with the PC, uh, you know, the Color mode there. It's showing the flashing cursor, isn't it? But nothing else. So that's a little bit strange. Let's just see if we can reboot that and see do the memory test, maybe. So if we do PC reset, and then we click here, there you go. It's doing the RAM test, look. Hey, fantastic. I'm very pleased. So we've got the 640K base RAM, and we've got 384K of extended memory there. Yeah, so battery failure, we do need to do something with that DS1287 there. The colours have gone a bit weird there, can you see that? We've got some sort of artefacting going on here. That might be a normal thing with this. It could be a problem with maybe the RAM 
where it passes the video. I mean, maybe that's why the colour stuff doesn't work. I don't know. So there could be a fault with this. It could be a jumper thing. It could also just be an incompatibility with the 536. So the interesting thing with this, I think I'm going to need to connect an actual floppy drive. I could be wrong. I need to just research this a little bit because I don't see any options in uh, in the PC stuff here. Which close that. Yeah, the stuff here, PC prefs, we only had like the base address stuff, and that's it. You know, we've got some system stuff, services, uh, so I don't see any way to sort of use the Amiga drive as a PC drive. I think you can do that on the 386 board, and in fact, I think uh, from watching Chris's video, He's got, uh, on the 386 one, you've got like a, um, a floppy port on the back of it, which you can connect to an external Amiga floppy drive and use that. So, I mean, that would have been really nice, but I'm going to have to get a floppy drive, I think, to connect this up. I've got some three and a half inch floppy drives somewhere nearby here, but I think they're all high density. Mind you, it's an AT, isn't it? So it should work. And I need a cable, obviously, to go with it. So, I'll have a think about that. I might go and get my DOS 622 disc, see if we can boot from floppy, maybe. Right, so here we are a couple of months later, I've had uh, to do a load of stuff that's uh, you know, arrived in between just to get my bench free really and get floor space. So we booted up with a TF536 here, we've got 640k, testing memory over 1 meg, total memory 1 meg, battery failure, so we'll deal with that next. The other thing is, I've got, I can't remember if I've swapped it already, got a, a different CPU here. This might be the original one that was on there, yeah. But I've also got another replacement CPU that can be overclocked, so we can go faster. Uh, and in fact, I'm going to swap that chip now and just make sure that chip works. So I'll just get the wrist strap on. Let's just get this out. Yeah, so where's the CPU now? Yeah, so the CPU's here. Yeah, I think I had an Intel in my spares. Yeah, and I, so I tested that, that works. So it's good to know I've got a spare Intel one. We'll try and get this out with the PLCC extract, uh, so it's going to go like that and we'll carefully just try and squeeze let's just move that out of the way before I damage that yeah they're not the easiest thing to get out PLCC chips certainly with this extractor there we go so I'll just inspect the pins yeah that looks okay a bit oxidized on the underside but you know what that Intel CPU had been sat around blooming ages yeah, so we've actually got two things here. We've got an FPU as well. So we've got a CPU and an FPU. And the FPU, I've gone for the gold top, like the last one in the range, actually. Is it an XL or something? X something? I can't remember the part number. I'll stick it to the top left. I've got the wrist strap on still here. Which means it can go pretty fast and it's more efficient. So yeah, there's a bit of oxidisation there. I'm just going to clean that up. We won't be cleaning the legs on that because the gold plated, you want to use deoxid on gold plated legs. Anyway, let's just go over those with the fiberglass pen. Yeah, so here, these pens here, well, they look a bit corroded actually. Certainly that one. I really should have tested this sooner. It's uh, an eBay China special. Yeah, just inspecting that with magnification. They look alright, it's kind of an optical illusion. You might see like black spots from where you're looking, but there aren't any when I'm looking with magnification. Yeah, so Harris, CS80C286-20, copyright Intel 8285. So yeah, Harris uh, manufactured these under license, and uh, yeah, they go up to 20 megahertz. Uh, now, it's not just going to automatically be at 20 megahertz, we're going to have to change one of the crystals and some jumpers on here probably. Anyway, let's just try and get that into socket we can just checking I've got that the right way round and I have yeah we won't stick the coprocessor in just yet let's just do this as a two phase thing and um, we'll finish off with the real time clock and then later we'll perhaps change the uh, clock speed of this so you obviously need to be careful to make sure everything's aligned properly here that's it so let's get it back in yeah, so this board was giving me a few green screens and a few black screens not booting, you know, hitting the IDE once and then not doing anything. And uh, I had to reseat the ATX power connector a few times there. So I think it's all about power, actually. 
there's a brightness thing on this as well. When you first part on it, it's darker and then it gets brighter as the video comes on. So I'm not ruling out there's still some sort of video issue on this 2000. Anyway, let's now go in here. Um, PC Mono just gives a load of dodgy characters, but PC Color, if it's working. Hey! So that CPU works because we wouldn't have got this far. It wouldn't have, you know, booted from the BIOS here, would it, and uh, given us all this diagnostic information. So that's good. So the next thing we'll do is get the FPU in. It's a C80287XL. So as I have to say, I think that's one of the, the best 287 chips you can get. We've got a bent pin there, look. Well, you can see that, just marginally bent. But the gold plated, so yeah, don't clean them with a fiberglass pen, whatever you do. Just a little bit of uh, deoxy. In fact, let's just do that, let's do something. Because there could just be a little bit of contamination on those and that. I don't want to be taking it in and out. I'd rather just get it in working first time. So uh, yeah, this stuff is designed, that pin there's bent, designed for gold contacts. Alright, that's pretty straight I think. Right, it's about as straight as that's going to get. Let's see what we could do. Just to make sure, let's use the cathars. Chip uh, leg straightener here. And press like that. That's it. Hey, nice and straight now. Yeah, pin one is marked up there. So we just need to just carefully get that into position. And slowly press it in. None of those legs folded, that was a really tight fit. You could hear that as it snapped in there. Anyway, pin one is right at the top, so let's get the daughter board fitted again and give it one more try. And then I'm going to deal with the uh, Dallas real time clock here. Can you see that? That ground is coming out of that. Oh, I really hate these adapters. And this is the thing, and it, it drives me to despair, this machine. So I'm just going to disconnect, reconnect, disconnect, reconnect to the power connector. Let's try it again. See how there's no green screen now? That tells me it is about voltage. I think. Just watching the IDE. Alright, let's hit the IDE. Because the IDE on this should be pretty blooming quick. Right, there we go. So that's all booted up. PC, PC colour. Yeah, so we've got a battery failure there. Oh, it's still booting, I think. Or is it? He doesn't use the. Oh, there we go. It's got a little bit further there. Um, so, setup. Uh, maybe we should go into setup because it might show the FPU or something there. There's nothing up there, look. I mean, we could try PC reset. Let's just see if we can see that. What I hate on Amiga OS is that you, the, you click on a window, it doesn't take focus at the front. I prefer if it overlaid the one you're on, if you do PC reset. Yeah, so there's nothing else appears before that. You can see that now doing the memory test. I think I need to connect a keyboard up. And just go into setup. Just see if there's anything in setup about the FPU. Right, so plug in a keyboard in, it may reset. No, it hasn't done. Uh, let's just try and resize that down here again. So it's control alt escape. What's alt? Oh yeah, control alt escape. There we go. Uh, so coprocessor installed. There we go. So that's good, isn't it? We don't know if it works or not, but it's certainly installed. So the next thing is sort the real time clock out I think. There's a few different ways of doing that, you could just replace the chip, you could dremel into the top of the chip to get to the battery contacts, but I've seen a few people drill into the side of the chip to access the contacts, so you know what, I might do that, I don't know, I'll report back in a minute. So I separated the daughter board from the main part of the card there. Uh, the next thing we'll do is get off the DS1287 because whether we drill it or try and pull half the cap off with a Dremel or something or whatever, it's going to be better working on it off the board. 
I covered that sort of technique in the Philips CDI video. I'll stick a link top right to that. In that case there, I did it while it was on the board, which was a wee bit risky. I was just getting a bit lazy, really. It was just a quick and easy way of doing it. And I didn't damage anything, but yeah, you could damage something by doing it when it's in situ. Certainly because there's stuff all around it here. If we want to drill into the side of it or something here, you know, there's all these components right next to the plumbing thing. So, yeah, there's not very many solder points. There's a number there, probably like data bits or something, but then the pins on this side here, the fragmented lot, there's gaps in between them. Again, we covered the same sort of thing in the Falcon video, didn't we? Was it part two, maybe, where we swapped that out? I think it was. There'll be a link top right to the Falcon video there. It's not exactly the same chip, but it's uh, and it's not the same chip on the Philips CDI either, but it's the same kind of chip. You know, it's a real-time clock chip with a battery on board. It's got a crystal on there as well, under that big extended uh, package top that it has, uh, and some non-volatile RAM. The settings are held by the battery. Anyway, we'll just use the desolder pump here if we can. I will often go to this, you know, just use the desolder pump now, the engineer in particular from Andrew Littleboy, rather than use my desolder station because the desolder station gets dirty really quick. The desolder station occasionally blocks up and I prefer to keep the desolder station for those times where I'm really struggling to desolder something. Hang on. Yeah, that's the consequence of the desolder pump. Sometimes the plugs don't always come out and then they get stuck back on. Um, but yeah, I use the desolder station as a last resort, really. The other thing is the nozzles I've got, they're not as small as these pads, so I'll end up removing some solder mask. And I, I'm sure I've got the smallest nozzle you can get for it. Yeah, so you just do, you know, slightly less pad and trace uh, markage and stuff when you uh, use a uh, manual desolder pump like this. What makes it hard here is this. That's the other thing, the desolder station would be almost pressing on that. So, yeah, you might want to get caps and tape around anything plastic like that before you start trying to desolder. Alright, so what I'll do at this stage now, just because we've been using a pump, is just have a bit of a brush there. I'll inspect with magnification. Right, I went over those a second time, just quickly. Uh, let's just use this now, just to see if any of these will snap free. Yeah, a few of those feel fairly loose. Not there so much. Yeah, I am not going to wrench this off, I just want to just... There you go, look, you see that's loose. It's like loose here, loose all on that side, maybe stuck in this side down here. And that would be because I've not desoldered that point there. Yeah, there you go. Simple explanation why it's not quite off yet. And also, why he shouldn't wrench it, <laughs> just in case you have missed a point. Let's just get a wee bit more solder onto that. Yeah, counterintuitive. Adding more fresh solder with flux can actually make it flow better. Yeah, there is the odd particle on there. Let's just grab that one pin if I can. Just try and wobble that one pin on its own, snap it off. It's barely protruding through that pin, you know. See if that's it. There we go, it's coming off. Look. Hey! There we are, no damage. So, hmm, the question is, what to do about this? You can see, if you look on the underside, can you see the glossiness here? Yeah, there's like a plastic lid, that's a ceramic chip, uh, you know, not a ceramic, a plastic chip, yeah, but it's got a plastic frame around it, and that's, you know, it extends up here, and under here, there's a button cell and a crystal. So, by virtue of, you know, removing a big chunk of this with a Dremel, you can see the battery, you can get the contacts, you can put a CR203 to hold it on top and do it that way. But you could also uh, drill into the relevant uh, places here on the side 
and it cuts, you know, if you drill just right, you'll cut where the battery joins the pin and then you can just join a wire um, to the pin to put a CR2032 on. So I'm not sure which way I'm going to do that. I'm just going to go and have a think. Right, so there's a great channel I'll link to down below. Yeah, so it's an evolution in the process. You know, back in the day, I worked out this myself. Back in the day, I, you know, I saw this plastic housing around here and went, that's a chip with something bodged on it, isn't it? And I actually hacked away with a hacksaw and knife and stuff and actually found the battery. But a video I saw on YouTube, a guy, what he's done is it's pin 20, yeah, is where the battery is connected to internally here. But there is no pin 20. Pin 20 is missing. So he worked out if you just drill a hole here into the side of the pin where it's been chopped off, you can just solder a wire. Now, technically, you've still got the battery in there. You add in a bit of charge. It's never a good idea to charge a battery that's not designed to be charged. It's never going to be a problem on a crusty old battery like that. Yeah, I'll try and do this without cutting myself now. It's seized up. There we go. It's just not being used since I did that CDI. <laughs> So let's take that out, put this in, I think, just give it a little bit of extended length there. Tighten that up, there we go. And I now need to go get my safety glasses. So if you're doing something like this, do take safety seriously. Trust me, you get a particle of plastic flying off there, or even this breaking, or one of these shattering, and you do. Um, at however many thousand, probably like 5,000, 10,000 RPM, trust me. Maybe even hand protection as well. So let's just see if that's working. And it is. Of course, I could damage my screen here, <laughs> you know, my monitor. And yeah, I can't see very well through these glasses, if I'm honest. But I am just going to carefully now try and estimate where pin 20 would be. Oh, that's going to be somewhere here. And I think that's it, actually. Assuming that that is the next pin in line, I think that's it. So that's all we need. A little metallic surface like that, there, where we can solder our wire on. I think. I'm just trying to think, does that look right? Just coming straight down here, yeah. So let's give that a try. So that was pretty painless, really. And this is the thing that is so much easier than trying to do what I did previously a couple of times in the past, which is to dremel all the main body of the package away here. You could argue the way I've done it previously is a better way of doing it in the sense that you've removed the old crusty battery. But I really don't think it's a big deal. I really don't think it's a big deal. And that it was just so quick and easy to do, wasn't it? So I would rather go that way and just leave the crusty battery on there. Right, I've got a brand new 2032 here. Hang on. These battery things are never easy to open, are they? It's just like you rip the stuff off and then it never comes out and you... Everything always feels so difficult to me because I don't follow the instructions and cut around it like it shows on the instructions. Instructions are for people that want an easy life. There we go, so uh, I'm going to stick this in here. The reason being is, which one's positive? Positive's the top. Uh, yeah, well we know this is negative, yeah, so the positive is that bit. That's all I was trying to work out here. And um, what I'm going to do is mail it like that. Yeah. And then I can just use a little bit of wire, join it there. Just need to make sure it will fit in the profile on the board here. And you need to make sure, you know, whatever it's going into, it's not going to clash. So, you yeah, see, the problem here might be these jumpers. This is the thing. So, I've got to kind of size up. You know, if we stuck it to those jumpers, it could be a problem. So, I might just stick it on the end like that. There. So, positive wants to go. Like that, yeah, there we go. So I'm going to mount it uh, like that. And to do that, I'm just going to use a double-sided pad. I can put some epoxy around it later. So I'm going to try and stick this as essentially as possible over the end here. Like that, I think. That'll do. Yeah, it's not going anywhere, it's just going to assist me while I do my wires, I think. 
and we'll get a wee bit of solder in there. Now bear in mind the plastic's going to melt when I touch this, so I'll try not to touch the plastic, but that is right next to the plastic. There we go, a little bead of solder. Just soldering that wire there, cut to length, and adding a piece of heat shrink tubing. I'll get some hot air on that and then we can just re, uh, you know, move the position of that around a little bit. So I'll place your bets, do you think this is going to work? Mm, I don't know. I think so. Did I even get pin 20? I think I did. I think it's kind of looks where it's aligned there. It's interesting, isn't it, how the chip had it on, yeah, but then they cut the pin off. <laughs> it's like if they just left it there, you wouldn't need to do any of this. Alright, 200 degrees. Just a wee bit more. Yeah, and obviously just the ground to deal with now on the other side. There we go, 160, 170, so let's shrink. He, he, shrink. Let's just push it marginally up that way. Yeah, we haven't got much flexibility here, but, you know, I was thinking that I could just, like, just massage it, there we go, away like that. Just so it's away from where it would uh, be on the board. The key now really is just to just to see if this is going to fit. Have I bodged this up? Yeah, it's going to go that way. No, that's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. And uh, I'm too lazy to go look at the data sheet, so let's just work out where ground is on here. Yeah, so the easy way to do that, I think, is from one of these 7 4 series here. So, 7 4 series, you know, it's always uh, pin one. Yeah, furthest away from pin one on the same side as your ground, so we know that's the ground. So let's just have a look around here. In the footprint where we remove the DS1287. There you go, it's actually the same sort of logical <laughs> arrangement where it's the bottom right, you know, pin one's here, it's the bottom right is the ground. Again, soldering a small wire and fitting a piece of heat shrink for that one as well. Right, right, there we go. Right, I'm now just going to add a wee bit of solder onto the point where that wire joins that pin at the bottom. And I, I mean just like a little bit, there we go. Tiny, tiny, tiny little bit. That's it, it's joined. And then what I can do then is just use the cutters to cut off the excess piece of wire that's kind of just flapping in the breeze here, if I can find the blue thing. That's it. Yeah, so I'm not sure if you can see that, but I've wrapped it around that pin three or four times, just soldered it to the very bottom of it, and you can see it's still flat, you know, there's no solder sticking out. We've got our ground, we've got our voltage coming in, three volts, so uh, that should be it. Should be able to just get a button cell in there, and give it a try. And of course I could just measure the voltage, and I'm going to do my usual uh, OCD battery polishing here. <laughs> yeah. It will bug me if I see a fingerprint on that. It just looks so nice but it's nice and shiny look. There we go. Yeah and just measuring on volts DC. I know this doesn't really prove anything does it? Because uh, well <laughs> it doesn't doesn't really prove anything. It just shows we've got the voltage there. It might not be right. It might not have even the right pin so I measure from the ground to there because obviously there is no pin. Hang on. There you go, 3.196 volts. So it seems all right, doesn't it? Let's get it installed and see if that's solved the problem with the battery. I'm so grateful to Chris Edwards for sending this to me. So I will just inspect that to make sure I've not got any bridges or anything there, and I have soldered all the pins. Because we missed one when I removed it, and I wouldn't surprise me if I've missed a pin there. When you get gaps between pins, it's really easy to miss one. So a wee streak there. There we go. There we go, that's not too bad. And it doesn't really look like anyone's tinkered with it. <laughs> Until you look on that side. 
Now, I think there should be a speaker on this as well. That's the other thing. I don't hear it beep. So is there an onboard one? Is it a jumpered speaker? Does the sound come through the Amiga side and I'm just not hearing it? I honestly don't know. Uh, anyway, everything is connected back up here now. Let's just see. See what happens together. Right, here we are booted up. Now, it's probably going to give us an error because obviously the settings are not, you know, uh, they're not defaulted or anything. Let's do PC color. Ooh, it's not gone about the battery this time. That's a good sign. But we'll need to go into the setup, I think, maybe. Yeah, no issue about the battery there. Control, Alt, Escape. Sorry, is it Control, Alt, Escape? Yeah, Control, Alt, Escape. So let's set these. Base memory, extended memory. I'm not sure if you can extend the memory on this one. You'd probably need an ISA card with some RAM on it or something. Uh, I think that's it, so I can't quite see what it says. Q to set up and reboot. Let's just scroll up down a bit. E, update CMOS and reboot, so let's do that. E. See if we can get 1.44 meg drive working with it, that's the next thing. Then I can boot DOS 6.2.2, I think. So the cable that Chris kindly bundled with this is the original cable, and it's just they've got a single connection here, you know, an IDC connection, 34-way, that goes on here. I marked this with the, the red dot here. I think it, originally I said it was the green stripe or something towards the top, or the blue stripe, I can't even see it here. Yeah, so pin one goes to the top there, but because this cable's only got one connection, and it's for the five and a quarter style floppy drive, you know, that's a, a card edge type connector with a little divider there yeah you'd need to use that with like a 360k or a 1.2 meg five and a quarter disk drive i sourced one of these it came from a company called rhino cables and they're pretty good cables actually it's a, you know a decent length uh, and it's got the twist and stuff here you need and this is the side here actually that you need to connect to the three and a half inch floppy drive not the one before the twist it's the one after the twist there yeah you can see i've got a hewlett packard 1.44 meg floppy drive connected up there and i'll have a got booting from these backups of dos 622 i do have some original acer 6.2 discs somewhere so i formatted a disc okay and then i thought i could transfer some files on my main pc via that floppy now i've got obviously a modern pc so i've got a few different things here so i've got dos 3.2 here, I can boot from that as well. 720k disc. Anyway, I've got to check it. Let's just stick that disc in and see if it will read it. It's a 720k disc. That drive is from a modern Dell machine, actually, but again, will be coming onto my video soon. So, because we've not booted DOS properly here with high mem and all that sort of stuff, you know, no device drivers or anything, it's just a command prompt boot. Will this work or not? I don't know. Check it. I used to use this all the time. Back in the day. I can't remember. I think this has a performance check thing in there. But there's another one I want to download that I don't think I've got. Is it PC Mark or something like that? I'm not going to be able to run the ones that run, you know, like graphics and stuff like that. We need a VGA card, really. And that might be an update to this. I may do a part two where I get, get a VGA card and a sound card. Uh, I may try and set up a hard disk uh, file or something in this video. I'm not sure. I've never done it before, so I'm not really sure what's actually involved. What I don't want to do is like petition my drive. You know, the actual hard drive. I'd rather just have a, a flat file somewhere that I can use. So, okay. Yeah, it keeps popping up with this. I think it's not got a path set to find the work volume, but you click cancel and it just works. Uh, 287. Hey! Obviously we need to bump up this clock speed, yeah? I'm very pleased though. I'm very pleased everything seems to be working. So we've got tests, benchmarks. Let's just do that main system. Fourteen ninety three dry stones. Determine math speed. AO two eight seven. Now I'm not sure if this is a synchronous or not. The uh, the FPU. 
Wow, look at that. It's fantastic, isn't it? So it's 51 times an IBM PC XT. Um, in terms of the CPU, 4.34 times an IBM PC XT. This is why it's preferable really to get the A2286 rather than the A8088, is it? Um, yeah, I get an AT, you know, a 286 rather than an XT. I'm very pleased though, it, it works and the colours are pretty good and everything. The key there, you can see 286 running at 8.1 megahertz, so how close can get to 20? I don't know. There may be some, you know, reliance on uh, the chipset there in terms of what speed you can push it to. Bear in mind the CPU we've got fitted should go up to 20 megahertz, and I think it's the same with the uh, FPU. So that felt like a good place to bring part one to a close. We'll come back to this in part two for some more upgrades and stuff. Uh, you know, obviously we haven't increased the clock speed of the CPU yet. You can see though, uh, the observant, there's a number of things different about this board. So it gives you a clue to some of the things in part two. So a massive, massive, massive thanks to Chris Edwards. I am so really over the moon to have this in my collection. It's uh, probably going to be the board that goes into my main uh, 2000 I think. I've got a 386 card, a couple of those, some repairs, those are the painful, absolutely painful coming up and uh, those I think, one of those I'm, I'm going to buy off Stefan and it will probably go into my 4000 so yeah between the two of these it's amazing I'm going to have a 286 from Chris Edwards and a 386 as you see later hopefully if I can fix that thing it's uh, a bit of a nightmare. We'll have a look at hard disk stuff in the next video as well as uh, things like a read, copy files across test some games and do some upgrades and things and add some ISA cards as well as a few other upgrades and tweaks and things to this so I do hope you found the video interesting if you'd like to support the channel please see the coffee and patreon links down below please do consider giving the thumbs up a hit if you liked the video because we're just getting so few views recently it's like all of this stuff is kind of making me consider my time spent on YouTube if that makes sense uh, yeah I'm very grateful for all the support I'm getting but that's been dropping as well it's just a sign of the times isn't it and I'm not moaning about money what I'm saying is it's um, all a factor you know, being able to afford to keep doing this, but also because YouTube's not pushing videos out, I'm getting hardly any hits, hardly any views. It's uh, I do question the use of my time. But anyway, I do hope you found the video interesting. Catch you in the next one.